Um, now, before we get started, I want to preface the lesson with just one consideration of engaging with our culture. Uh, you see, when we talk about engaging with our culture or engaging with rather people in the world, uh, we're faced with the two extremes. You know, on the one hand, uh, of totally and utterly rejecting the culture, you know, saying that it's uh, that it's all bad and it's all evil, or on the other side of of adopting everything, of of saying, you know, this is good. We should uh, we should follow the with the majority view or what everyone else says. Uh, and as Christians who've been called to live in the world, but not to be of the world, we have to reject both of these. And we have to instead recognize that by God's common grace, there's good in the world. There's, there's good in culture and society. But because of the fall and because of sin, there's at the same time evil uh, in it. And we must be steeped enough in the Bible and also know the culture well enough to know what to adopt and what to reject. Now, what are we going to talk about tonight? Well, the title of the lesson, which comes from Tim Keller's book, is A Category-Defying Social Vision. And there are five areas that we're going to look at where we see the impact of this Christian social vision on society, and specifically as it comes to the church. And that is that it, it creates a church that is multi-ethnic, that is committed to the poor, that strives for peacemaking, that is strongly pro-life, and with a revolutionary sexual ethic. So I hope you don't have any plans for later tonight, because we're going to be here. No, we're going to be here 20, 25 minutes, so don't worry. Uh, and the first thing we're going to look at is for to build this multi-ethnic church. Uh, so the first text we'll look at comes from Ephesians 2, uh, verses 11 through 22, which, look at that. Thanks, Tom. Uh, starting in Ephesians 2, verse 11. And if you have one of these Bibles uh, here, it's page 976. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ. You who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one, And has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off. And peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in Him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now you see, in the, in the Roman context, in the Greco-Roman t- context in you know, the first few centuries uh, A.D., so the way that you decided religion was you were born. In whatever context you were born, you know, the country, the family... Those became your gods. That's who you worshipped. And there was a clear divide between those of your own religion and those of all others. Now, at the heart of this passage in Ephesians, we have division and reconciliation. You know, that, that first division, that because of sin, we are divided. We are alienated from God. You know, we see other texts that say that we are 
that we are rebels, that we are enemies of God, a clear divide, but this division is not only vertical between us and God, it's also horizontal between us and our fellow man. Um, and we see this division even in the same family, you know, in the chapter right following the fall, you know, in, in, in chapter 4 of Genesis, as a brother kills a brother. And we see this division throughout the Old Testament, Israel being enslaved and, and you know, later coming to the land and um, you know, filled with battles and being attacked by various nations. And I could count to pointless examples in history, even in the history of the church, where we see this division clearly on display. But the highlight of this, uh, is, of this passage is the reconciliation. The reconciliation that Jesus has brought about of how he has reconciled us to God, but he's also reconciled us to our neighbor. You know, we may meet someone who who believes in Christ, who, while a stranger, is also a brother or a sister in Christ. And because of our union with Christ, because we're one with him, we're united to them as well. See, there's, there's nothing more fundamental uh, in this world, then our relation you know, to God, not our race, our ethnicity, our sex, our age. You know, we find in the Gospels that when Jesus went out preaching the Gospel, uh, his mother, his brothers once came looking for him. Um, and Jesus said to the man who told them, who is my mother? You know, who, who, you know and who are my brothers? And it's that he stretched his his hand out towards the disciples uh, that were there and said, here are my mothers and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, he is my brother, my sister, and my mother. See, that which transcends really all earthly identities is our faith in Jesus, is following him as Lord and Savior. So even though important, you know, your country, your family, your ethnicity, those things you know, are not the most fundamental identifiers of who we are, but rather the faith in Jesus that we have. And so by virtue of being united to Him, you know, having put our faith and our trust in Him alone for our salvation, we're now united to other Christians as well. They are our brothers. They are our sisters. Now, how do we apply this situation today? Well, the church, it should look like the community that surrounds it. You know, does the church reflect its surroundings? You know, Keller says that in a world divided by tribe and race, there's no greater witness to the power of the gospel. And he is right. You know, I remember growing up, and I uh, was a part of a, of, a, of a sports team, played American football in Sweden, uh, and my football team consisted of guys from all over the place. You know, we had Swedes, Kurds, Turks, Finns, uh, Iranians, Tanzanians, you know, from various socioeconomic statuses, and we were all part of a, of a team. We were all, in a sense, united because we, we loved the sport. And I think we can think of other examples of where sport or other things have brought people together from various backgrounds and demographics. And what of the church? You know, how does the church reflect this union between brothers and sisters in which Christ that tr- transcends all differences? So the church should reflect the community in which it finds ourselves. And it's not a matter of diversity for diversity's sake. It is not that the primary goal is diversity. The goal is to worship God, to honor and glorify Him, and to reach the lost with the gospel as He has commissioned us And the question we can think about over this coming week is this. You know, should the local church be multi-ethnic? And if the answer is yes, then what can we do as a church, as individual Christians, to strive towards that? Again, not to make that the primary goal of the church, but for it to be a consequence or a result of seeking to live faithfully as we follow our Lord's commands. Now, second, creating a church committed to poor, to the poor, and to justice. Um, you know, the, the pagan emperor Julian 
uh, as he writes to, a high, to his high priest in the 4th century, he laments the fact that paganism is not growing. It is not expanding. Uh, and the reason it doesn't, he says, is because of the pagans themselves. You see, their worship of the gods, he said, was splendid and, and magnificent. It could not be any better. However, that is all they do. They don't care for strangers, nor do their, their lives reflect their faith. So Julian tells the high priest to go persuade them to live righteously. Shame the pagans to live this way. And what is one of the reasons he's saying this? Was well, because the Christians took care not just of the Christian poor, but even of the pagan ones. And everyone in the empire saw that the pagans did not provide anything while the Christians cared for strangers and the needy. Why did the Christians do this? They knew who their neighbor was. You know, think of the parable of the Good Samaritan, you know, where Jesus said that to, f- to fulfill the law, we have to love God and to love our neighbor. And when asked, you know, who is our neighbor, he gives this parable of a man who had uh, you know, been, been, been attacked and was lying nearly dead and had all these people pass him by. You know, the holy people of the time, the priests, the Levite, those who were in charge of the worship of God. But then a Samaritan stops and takes him and cares for him and brings him back to health. And you know, the emphasis that we see in the story is that it's supposed to be shocking because Jews and, and Samaritans at this time, you know, they did not even speak to each other. You had this huge divide between the two. Uh, but we see how countercultural it was as it answers the question of who is my neighbor? Well, it is anyone, even the one most unlike you. It's not just the person living physically next door. It's not those that are, that are like you, who agree with you and hold the same views as you. So when we see someone in need, the first question should not be, I wonder what they did to end up in this situation. You know, or where are they from? Or who did they vote for? Or what is their opinion on X, Y, or Z? In Z. Um, instead, we may learn from Christ and his response to the weak and the needy as we see over and over Scripture and he had compassion on them. You know, he had compassion. Now, how can you as an individual employ this principle? It's an overwhelming task, isn't it? I mean, the whole world is full of needy people. But remember that God has not called you to save the world. But he has given you opportunities to help. You know, one principle commonly employed that is helpful, I think, is the principle of proximity. You ask yourself, who is closest to you? Who has God placed near you? In your neighborhood? In your workplace? You know, somewhere here in Edinburgh? You know, we are finite. We are limited beings. We cannot care for everyone, but we can care for some. So ask yourself how you may be able, as a follower of Christ, to love and to serve Him by loving and serving the needy. Uh, and the third, we see striving for peacemaking. And this is for, uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 2. Um, we'll look at a few verses, um, 11 through 12, and then 21 through 23. So we see, it's, so we see it's, uh, it says, uh, starting in verse 11 of chapter 2, uh, it's 1 Peter 2.11. Uh, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Now there's much hostility today, is there not, in disagreements 
definitely online, Twitter and other places, but sometimes also in person, you know, where words are considered violence, where to disagree means to hate uh, one another. You know, even the algorithms of social media are made in such a way to cause a reaction for you to feel like you have to respond. You, know, you have to reply. You have to submit a tweet to show how you feel about this issue. Now, what we see in this passage from 1 Peter is that we're called to follow Christ. But in, in, in what way? Well, we are to conduct ourselves in such a way that unbelievers cannot speak against us. We may suffer, yes, but may we not suffer because we've done evil ourselves. So when we consider how we should conduct ourselves, Keller lays forward four characteristics of humility, of patience, of tolerance, and a lack of self-righteousness. So, when, so that as we speak with someone with whom we disagree, we may be humble because we know that we are finite, we are limited, we are sinful, we do not know all things, and then we may be patient, taking our time before we rush to judgments, you know, trying to understand. We may be tolerant, so that even when deeply disagreeing, we treat them as someone made in God's image. And finally, we lack self-righteousness because we know that we are not perfect, that we've only been accept- accepted by God because of what Christ has done, because of his life and, and his death on our behalf. And then we see, fourthly, that it leads towards having a church that is strongly pro-life. Uh, the late Larry Hurtado, who used to teach right here at New College, he highlights a practice that was common in the time of the Roman Empire called infant exposure of throwing out unwanted babies left to die or to end up in slavery. At the time, it did not cause much of a moral outrage. outrage. And it gives an example of a letter that was found, a letter that a man had sent who was, a, who was in the Roman army, and he was sending his wife this letter in 1 BC, and he tells his wife to take care of their child that they have, uh, and then speaking about her being pregnant, he says, if it is a boy, you know, let it be. If it is a girl, cast it out. And then he just moves on, and he exp- moves on to express his love for his wife, saying, you know, how can I forget you? I beg you, don't be anxious, as he was away serving the army. See, it was fine at this time uh, in the culture that if you did not want a child that was born, you could throw it out. One study says that the Roman Empire needed about 500,000 slaves a year, and about 150,000 of those were made up by unwanted children that had been thrown out. A lot of early Christian writers like Justin Martyr spoke against this practice. Few pagans as well, but not really enough to change anything in that regard. Now, what is at the heart of the Christian concern for the life of the unborn? Or indeed, life from conception all the way to death. It's the image of God. You know, when God made Adam and Eve, he made them in his image. Because of that, all humans have value, worth, and dignity. So we look at uh, a psalm here, uh, Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. Psalm 139, starting in verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. 
So each human has been fearfully and wonderfully made by our amazing Creator. And because of this, Christians throughout history have cared for the unborn. They've cared for those born yet unwanted. Now, the Christian pro-life view extends uh, beyond pregnancy or birth, like I said earlier, from conception to death, encounters to crucial issues in our, uh, in our times, that of abortion and euthanasia. In the U.S. abortion debate, you know, made international news last week, as there's an ongoing court case that involves the 1973 Supreme Court case, Roe versus Wade. Now, much could be said, but we'll keep it brief, uh, as we consider the church's role and our individual role in the issue. See, we are bound by Scripture to uphold the sanctity and the dignity of life. Our position should not, however, merely be limited uh, to the child, but we should also consider the mother. I've seen churches and I've seen Christians model the type of love that we want to see. People that do not only vote to end abortion, but Christians and churches who actively love and support unwanted children, the mothers who are sometimes in extremely difficult situations. And as we think of euthanasia, we must yet, yet again go back to the image of God. You know, these are men and women with worth and with dignity. Often the ones who argue for euthanasia or you know, assisted suicide point to their people, their, you know, their sufferings to argue that they should deserve to die should they choose. But even in great suffering, we have been fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, James Eglinton, who's a lecturer at New College, wrote an op-ed in the Times where he argues, you know, citing a Jewish sociologist, that Hitler was the one who normalized a doctrine of life unworthy of life, where those who were terribly ill or handicapped were told their life was so bad that they should die before this principle was applied even more broadly. And this kind of thinking stems in itself in a worldview that views death as natural, whereas the Christian view staunchly holds that death is unnatural, that it is you know, the enemy. Uh, a large part of my previous job at the church that I came from was to visit the elderly in our congregation. You know, we had several that were uh, in nursing homes for, for various reasons. And I think they're called maybe care homes here. Uh, and as I went, they always loved when I visited. I mean, it, it didn't take much. I mean, there were ones that I, even that, I, that I barely knew when I started visiting them who were so excited because generally they didn't see that many people that, w- that would come and visit. And I think it's easy when your physical strength is minimal and, and your mental capacity is diminished, uh, especially when, when little thought or attention is given to you, few visitations by others, and you add on top of that a society that tells you that you should have the right to die because it is better for you to die than to live, then there's a danger to actually start believing it. See, if you read the Congregational Wednesday email that went out today, you saw that there's a bill considered by the Scottish uh, government on the topic of assisted suicide. And the Free Church has responded to it. Uh, and I will read just a few sentences from that. As it says, the Free Church of Scotland is fundamentally opposed to assisted suicide because it devalues human life, places undue pressures on the vulnerable, and is open to abuse and incremental extension. See, we believe life is a gift from God and those suffering deserve our compassion and care. Accordingly, we're committed to more palliative care and proper emotional and spiritual support for those facing death and their loved ones. And you can see the entire response in the link that is in the email. Now, as a church, as individuals, how may we think of being pro-life? We're not anti-women or anti-elderly Rather, it's an elevation of the value and the sanctity and significance of life. So in the week ahead, we may ask ourselves, how may, how may I live a life that is, 
is pro-life from conception to the grave. How may we love and support the, the unborn, the, the pregnant women, the, and the elderly? And that moves us on to the fifth and the final point we'll consider, which is the revolutionary uh, sexual ethic. Now, I remember when I was a teenager, uh, before I became a Christian, you know, living in Sweden, and I thought, you know, this here, this view was probably the one of all the Christian views that seemed the most antiquated and the most oppressive. Uh, as I became a Christian, I remember telling some of my friends that I would not have sex until marriage, and they were shocked. They could not fathom a reason behind that. And I think this is one of the areas that Christianity has so much wisdom and value to offer for our culture. See, our culture is enamored with sex. And you can read statistics of how, how earlier and earlier children are starting, or kids are starting to have sex, or even when they start watching pornography and the widespread use of this terrible practice, all of which showcase this, this enamoration of it. And you can read the data uh, on the harm that pornography causes uh, and to see, to see the danger that it poses to individuals, to families, to societies, and the consequences of the culture's view of sex, which is ultimately one of self-expression, self-gratification. We also see in light of the Me Too movement, where there are stories of me and my desires come first and trumps all others. And the Christian view clashes so strongly with culture's view of sex, you know, being truly antithetical. See, in the Christian view, sex only belongs within marriage. See, contrary to the culture's view and how some have taught it in the church, you know, God is not anti-sex. There's nothing intrinsically wrong or dirty about it. See, what the Bible does is it elevates the value and the, and, and the value of it. See, the culture says sex is no big deal, but the Bible says, no, it is. It is a big deal who you have sex with, and it's a big deal of how it's done, that it is consensual. See, consensual sex is also at the heart of the culture's view of sex. But ultimately, it was introduced by Christianity in a time when there was no such concept. However, it doesn't stop at consent. See, Keller puts it, wet, puts it well as he says that the culture's view of sex ultimately depersonal, depersonalizes and objectifies because it ultimately turns sex into a consumer good rather than as a means to nurture a bond of covenant. Sex outside of marriage is ultimately transactional and it cannot finally be intimate. The Christian view requires sex to always be super consensual, only for people ready to give their whole lives to each other. See, sex in the Christian view, therefore, is centered on self-giving, whereas the cultural view focuses on self-gratification and self-expression. See, on taking, the Christian view is one of giving. And we see this in 1 Corinthians 7, as Paul says that the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife should give to her husband. It's a relationship of giving of oneself. So when we think about conversations that we will have that concern the issue of sex, our challenge, I think, is to get the attention that we need. Now, Derek talked about attention as the step, step one a couple weeks ago, and you can listen to that online. Uh, but how do we get the attention of the person we're talking to? Because they may have the preconceived notion that Christianity thinks sex is bad. So the way, perhaps, to get their attention is by affirming the goodness of it, but then to move beyond that and show that because of its significance, it only belongs in the stable covenant union of marriage. And even beyond that, you know, pointing it to uh, the union that we see uh, you know, between uh, the uh, bride and her husband, as we do between Christ and his church. Now, in conclusion, as we end, my prayer for myself and for all of us is what Jesus prays in the high, what he prays in the high priestly prayer in John 17. As Jesus says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They're not of the world, 
just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So may we seek to stay in the world, but not of the world. You know, being keeping away from the devil and sanctifying ourselves in God's truth. May we steep ourselves in God's word so that we may know his truth. You know, I, I've heard, and I can't necessarily say that this is true, uh, but apparently when the U.S. government trains people to detect counterfeit bills, fake currency, the bulk of their time is spent not on studying ca- the counterfeits, but studying the real bills, the true bills, the, the, the right ones, so they may truly know what the, what, the, what the correct ones look like. So may we likewise be so steeped in the truth so we may know the truth. But at the same time, when we sit down and we talk to a friend or a stranger, a co-worker, may we seek to listen and to get to know them. You know, not the preconceived image or notion that we may have of them, but of who they are, you know, of what they believe and why they believe it. And share with them the truth of the gospel with humility, with kindness, and with grace. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us your wisdom. For Lord, we know that the, the, the so-called wisdom that we have on our own is, is merely foolishness. Father, we, we, we pray that you may make us wise, but at the same time, we pray that you may make us humble, that you will make us eager to, to listen and to hear uh, that we will be uh, slow to speak. Um, and that, that, Lord, that we, when we do enter in, into these uh, gospel conversations, Lord, we pray that it may, uh, we may rely on you and your spirit to give us, give us the words to speak. For Father, we know that there's nothing that we can say on our own that may, uh, that may bring them to life but that it is only uh, the words of your gospel empowered by your spirit. So, Father, we pray this prayer of, uh, of dependence upon you in the name of Jesus. Amen.